Few emperors of Rome possessed the learning and refinement of Marcus Aurelius. Power and pomp meant little to him. His great passion was for justice. Serving without salary, he supported himself and a host of court retainers from his own abundant riches. In a sensual age, he was a Stoic who practiced temperance, self-denial, and stern morality. Even those who found his abstemious way of life repellent revered him for his practical decency. Considerate toward the poor, he lowered their taxes and moderated their civil obligations, which had previously been oppressive. Deeming the brutality of gladiatorial exhibitions offensive, he ordered that they be given less frequently and with less bloodshed. Aurelius's literary gifts were exceptional, as revealed in his wise and pithy meditations, not written for publication, but as a kind of political, philosophical diary of private reflections. But Marcus Aurelius was an energetic persecutor of the Christians, and for zealous intolerance was a star of the first magnitude in a galaxy of persecuting emperors. During Aurelius's reign, and with his full sanction, Felicitas, Justin Martyr, Polycarp, and many thousands of less renowned Christians were cruelly tortured to death. Why would so decent a man have such a blot on his otherwise stainless record? The combined factors that affected Aurelius's thinking reveal much about the causes of religious persecution in every civilized age. Aurelius the persecutor makes an especially interesting study because his intolerance was the result, not of crude barbarism, but sophisticated political thinking infused with religious fervor. He had moral and ideological grounds for his policy of extinction toward Christians. It is well worth examining what made Marcus Aurelius, philosopher, humanitarian, and social reformer, a great persecutor. Aurelius's hedonistic age didn't love Stoicism, but honored it in the abstract as an ascetic form of self-improvement, practiced only by the most learned and disciplined. Human perfectibility through personal effort was the key doctrine of Stoicism. Originated by Zeno of Sicium in the 4th century BC and systematized by Epictetus three centuries later, this school of philosophy was pragmatic and evolutionistic, with a moderate dose of mysticism. Stoics saw nature's animating force as a divine spirit, inhabiting all matter more or less homogeneously. In this pantheistic order, humans were seen as inherently good, provided that they lived in harmony with their nobler instincts, otherwise called the God within. Reliance on a superior external being who made atonement for their sins was antithetic to the Stoics' view of life. Repentance and reconciliation for sin was to them an abominable idea, denigrating their, supposedly, innate moral sufficiency and power of self-improvement. In their view, a merciful savior was a guilt-provoking intruder into the citadel of humanity's natural decency and divinity. Devotion to virtue and duty in accord with natural law were the pathway to a pure conscience and moral bliss. To this ideology, Aurelius added duty to the state as a person's supreme obligation. In his view, the state embodied the highest manifestation of nature's order on earth. Dissent from the edicts of the state and its established traditions was a violation of nature and, hence, moral treason. He believed that religion was an essential part of life, and that the only valid religion was that of the state, whose collective wisdom was always superior to individual judgment. The idea of personal accountability to a divine creator, or of an individual conscience that might take allowable exception to the collective will, was alien to Aurelius's philosophy. Religious liberty or diversity was to him an intellectual affront, a species of moral anarchy and political subversion that must be eradicated for the good of all. Marcus Aurelius's reign, A.D. 161-180, began over a century and a half after the establishment of the Christian Church. Busy with the affairs of state and immersed in the traditions of pagan Rome, he was not disposed to objectively examine the influence of this foreign religion, which had been peaceable and constructive from its beginning. Instead, he followed the persecuting policy of his predecessors, even adding new force to it. He listened to the bigoted advice of his counselors, such as Cornelius Fronto and Junius Rusticus, who used their silver-tongued sophistry to turn Aurelius against Christians. Thus, he was fed with deliberate lies about the alleged treachery and barbarism of this interdicted sect. 
He also consulted mystics and oracles whose sensual superstitions and avarice aroused their instinctive dread of a religion that exemplified purity, truth, and charitable deeds. In short, Aurelius left his final judgment of religions other than his own to the council of religious experts opportunistically devoted to the state religion. In this move, he failed to reckon that no prejudice is so fierce as religious prejudice, and no intolerance so merciless as religious intolerance. He also failed to recognize his own moral duty to learn for himself the truth of God's revealed word. The reinstatement of Roman virtue, which was in steep decline, and the unity of the Roman Empire, which was unraveling through exploitation and self-indulgence, were the supreme objects of his life. This called for the extirpation of all dissenting elements. It was of no consequence to him that Christians had served loyally in both civil and military capacities. That loyalty could be a facade. A uniform ideology and unanimously observed religion were essential to the preservation of Roman power and civilization. Thus, for seemingly laudable ends, he spawned a misbegotten breed of religio-political absolutism. What is the significance of this historic precedent? Does it merely have antiquarian interest, like the discovery of crumbled columns in the wastelands of Greece or a batch of old coins in Byzantium? Or does it have a lesson for our day? Our time is strikingly similar in some respects to Aurelius's. As it was with second century Rome, the values of our civilization have been progressively crumbling for some decades. Today, more and more world leaders are seeing light and global unity, enforced as necessary by military might. Further, with a superficial religious syncretism and an almost mystic admiration for the papacy not witnessed since the Middle Ages, we find disturbing parallels to Aurelius's advocacy of a uniform religious worldview, allowing no alternatives or dissent. The current drift is toward a politically endorsed morality and common body of religious beliefs, whose substance is fashioned by the religious experts in Christendom, with political advice from non- and interpret moral issues in the rapidly changing social and political order. This universal shepherd of humanity might well be looked to as an educator of human conscience, a preceptor to the nations, not for his own glory, but for the preservation of human existence, liberty, and rights, as well as for the honor of God. Thus could emerge a kind of neo-Aurelianism bearing the stamp of generic Christianity. A New Intolerance but what should be the fate of those whose consciences cannot adhere to the official definition of personal freedoms, obligations, and rights, especially in religious matters? What if their religion, or absence of it, is deemed inimical to the good of society? Already it is possible to see how such nonconformance might kindle a modern-day inquisition to ascertain whose morals are sound, i.e., in agreement with the established creeds of the New World Order. Of course, this might be done with, presumably, the best of intentions, and yet the fruit of such pious zeal have always been bitter and bloody. If Christendom were united in upholding one view of orthodox morality, how could that controlling authority resist the temptation to be not only the definer of doctrine and educator of the conscience, but also the defender of the faith, corrector of deviancy, and enforcer of divine wisdom. Marcus Aurelius did this as an antagonist to Christianity, but the history of Europe and other Christian lands is rife with instances of persecution for religious causes, protagonistically undertaken in the name of Jesus Christ. As honorable seeming as may have been the motives of ecclesiastic councils, Protestant and Catholic by turns, for killing Huss, Jerome, Tyndale, the Huguenots, Albigenses, Waldensians, Anabaptists, Quakers, witches, and millions of other people who held disfavored religious beliefs, the spirit of persecution was still present in all those exploits. Persecution repudiated ironically the scriptural teachings of the religion that has the most onerous record of persecuting zeal actually condemn persecution. Who doesn't know that multitudes have been tortured and lynched in the name of Jesus? But how many recall that Jesus said, The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Luke 9.56 The occasion of these words is significant. 
They were Christ's response to the disciples' offer to call fire down from heaven to destroy the Samaritans, who had. Christ realized that the persecuting instinct found in many of his misguided followers would mar the future path of civilization. They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you. For my name's sake. Luke 21 12. We could interpret this prediction to mean equally that Christians will be persecuted by openly non-Christian powers, or that Christians will be persecuted by other supposed Christians for the sake of Christ's name and honor. Christ further hinted at this latter application in his saying, The time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. John 16, 2. But these blood offerings the God of love will not accept. Whatever one may think of Bible prophecy, it is thought-provoking to consider the apocalyptic visions of John the Revelator in light of current events. This longest lived of the apostles recorded a panoramic view of human history in its final stages before Jesus' second coming. He foretold a grand coalition of church and state whose spiritual nerve center, according to many expositors, Luther, Calvin, Gossin, Wesley, Henry, Clark, Barnes, Poole, et al., is Europe and its offspring nations. John depicts the final crisis and test facing all humanity as religious. All the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 3, 17. What a specter of religio-political totalitarianism is presented here. Fascination with miracles, man worship, global edicts, technology to enforce international law, rapid, world-girdling communications, economic interdict made possible by a universal system of exchange and trade-all factors that fit our times with staggering foresight. Who could fail to recognize that with the recent disintegration of communism, the militant discontent in the Islamic world, and the corresponding elevation of Christian democratic powers, Western religion is due for a mighty resurgence of power in international affairs? What glue could be more effective or apparently more desirable than that all races and nations come together into a universal unity of Christian morality, one that in its sense of moral superiority will brook no dissent and countenance no alternative creeds? Who could be so crabbed and narrow as to take exception to once impossible-seeming alliances alluringly endorsed by spectacular miracles and freely flowing goodwill. Dostoevsky correctly observed that the most entrancing combination of influences upon the unregenerate human mind is miracle, mystery, and authority. Far more people are inclined to give credence to spectacular miracles than to sobering truths. A Beacon of Warning we have much to learn today from Marcus Aurelius, humanitarian, reformer, unifier of nations, and devout persecutor. Chiefly, that his example as promoter, preserver, and enforcer of state-sponsored religion is one devoutly to be avoided. This caution has perhaps never been sounded more insightfully than by John Stuart Mill, who, more than a century ago, wrote, Absolute monarch of the whole civilized world, Marcus Aurelius, preserved through life not only the most unblemished justice, but what was less to be expected from his stoical breeding, the tenderest heart. The few failings which are attributable to him were all on the side of indulgence, while his writings the highest ethical product of the ancient mind scarcely differ 
from the most characteristic teachings of Christ. This man, a better Christian, in all but the most dogmatic sense of the word, than almost any of the ostensibly Christian sovereigns who since have reigned, persecuted Christianity. Inasmuch as the theology of Christianity did not appear to him to be true, or of divine origin, the gentlest and most amiable of philosophers and rulers, under a solemn sense of duty, authorized the persecution of Christianity. But it would be unjust to him and false to truth to deny that no one plea which can be urged for punishing anti-Christian teaching was wanting to Marcus Aurelius for punishing, as he did, the propagation of Christianity. No Christian more firmly believes that atheism is false and tends to all parts of the universe are interwoven and tied together with a sacred bond, and no one thing is foreign or unrelated to another. This general connection gives unity and ornament to the world. For the world, take it all together, is but one. There is but one sort of matter to make it of, one God that pervades it, and one law to guide it, the common reason of all rational beings, and one truth. If indeed beings of the same kind, and endued with the same reason, have one and the same perfection. Everything material quickly disappears into the universal matter, and everything causal is quickly absorbed into the universal reason, and the memory of everything is quickly overwhelmed by time. With rational beings action in accordance with nature and reason is the same thing. It is our responsibility then to act in line with reason. Either stand upright upon your own legs or upon your crutches. For Marcus, accidents, and all sorts of things we have no control over, will happen in a lifetime. But it's vital to realize that one's response to these things can influence things, for better or worse. Stoics like Marcus encourage us to resist overreacting or making things worse. So long as we remain solid in our understanding of the universe, and so long as we remember that external change does not cut at what really matters in life, we can refuse to allow things out of our control to have an outsized impact on our lives. The same principle applies to interpersonal problems. Let accidents happen to such as are liable to the impression, and those that feel misfortune may complain of it if they please. As for me, let what will come I can receive no damage by it, unless I think it a calamity and it is in my power to think it none, if I have a mind to it. Let people's tongues and actions be what they will, my business is to be good, and make the same speech to myself that a piece of gold or an emerald or purple should. Let people talk and act as they please, I must be an emerald and I must keep my color. Properly responding to things outside of our control depends on being able to maintain a positive mindset. Marcus Aurelius marvels at the capacity of the mind with the remark, Does the mind ever cause herself disturbance? Does she bring fears and passions upon herself? Let any other body try to frighten or trouble her if they can, for of her own conviction she will not turn to such impressions. And as for this small carcass, let it take care not to feel, and if it does, say so. But the soul, the seed of passion and pain, which forms an opinion on these things, needs suffer nothing unless she throws herself into these fancies and fears. For the mind is in her own nature self-sufficient and must create her wants before she can feel them. This privilege makes her undisturbed and above restraint unless she teases and puts fetters upon herself. The title of Marcus's text, The Meditations, might cause you to wonder, what do Stoics meditate about? And why is meditation such an important practice for Stoic philosophers? As you've seen, Stoics value rationality, especially in the face of change or unpredictability. The Stoic ideal is someone who is able to maintain calm, cool, and collected, even as things around them are chaotic and uncertain. To attain this ideal, Stoics recommend meditating on images or ideas that will counteract our immediate, often negative, emotional reactions to things. Worried about your reputation being destroyed? Remember that it will not be long before you will have forgotten all the world, and in a little time all the world will forget you too. Worried that one of your projects is going to fail? That being which governs nature will quickly change the present face of it. 
one thing will be made out of another by frequent revolutions, and thus the world will be always new. Marcus even recommends calling to mind particular images or thoughts that remind you that all that matters in life is virtue. Suffering and death are some of the biggest topics of Marcus's meditations, because it is a state of flux that's always threatening to distract us from what really matters. Here are some of his meditations on these topics. Concerning death. It is a dispersion if there are atoms, but if the universe is a unity, it is either extinction or change. As for pain, if it is intolerable, it will quickly dispatch you. If it stays long, it is bearable. Your mind in the meantime preserves herself calm by the strength of the opening faculty. A saying of Plato. He that has raised his mind to a due pitch of greatness that has carried his view through the whole extent of matter and time, do you imagine such an one will think much of human life? Not at all, says the other man in the dialogue. What then? Will the fear of death afflict him? Far from it. You are mightily out if you think a man that is good for anything is either afraid of living or dying. No. His concern is only whether in doing anything he is doing right or wrong, acting the part of a good man or bad. Here's a passage in which Marcus reflects explicitly on what we might call his philosophy of the good life. It is always and everywhere in your power to resign to the gods to be just to mankind and to examine every impression with such care that nothing may enter that is not well examined. Never make any rambling inquiries after other people's thoughts, but look directly at the mark which nature has set you. Nature, I say, either that of the universe or your own. The first leads you to submission to providence, the latter to act as becomes you. Now that which is suitable to the frame and constitution of things is what becomes them. To be more particular, the rest of the world is designed for the service of rational beings in consequence of this general appointment by which the lower order of things are made for the use of the more noble, and rational creatures are designed for the advantage of each other. Now a social temper is that which human nature was principally intended for. The next thing designed in our being is to be proof against corporeal impressions, it being the peculiar privilege of Rison to move within herself, and not suffer sensation or patient to break in upon her, for these are both of animal and inferior quality. But the understanding part claims a right to govern, and will not bend to matter or appetite, and good reason for it, since she was born to command and make use of them. The third main requisite in a rational being is to secure the ascent from rashness and mistake. Let your mind but compass these points and stick to them, and then she is mistress of everything which belongs to her. We ought to spend the remainder of our life according to nature, as if we were already dead and had come to the end of our term. Let your fate be your only inclination, for there is nothing more reasonable. Look inwards, for you have a lasting fountain of happiness at home that will always bubble up if you will, but dig for it. The art of living resembles wrestling more than dancing, for here a man does not know his movement and his measures beforehand. It is a saying of Plato's that no soul misses truth of her own good will. The same may be said with reference to justice, sobriety, good nature, and the like. Be particularly careful to remember this, for it will help to sweeten your temper towards all men. In closing, we'll leave you with some thoughts Marcus has about controlling life's more difficult emotions. In the meditations, he shifts from a general discussion of fate to a reflection on temper and the virtuous treatment of others. Marcus Aurelius reflects, Do not return the temper of ill-natured people upon themselves, nor treat them as they do the rest of mankind. Nature has not wrought your composition so close that you cannot withdraw within your own limits and do your own business yourself. For a man may be first-rate in virtue and true value, and yet be very obscure at the same time. You may likewise observe that happiness has very few wants. Granting your talent will not reach very far into logic. This cannot hinder the freedom of your mind, nor deprive you of the blessings of sobriety, beneficence, and resignation. He that has come to the top of wisdom and practice spends every day as if it were his last and is never guilty of overexcitement, sluggishness, or insincerity. It is great folly not to part with your own faults which is possible, but to try instead to escape from other people's faults, which is impossible. 
Whatever business tends neither to the improvement of your reason, nor the benefit of society, the rational and social faculty thinks beneath it. Nobody is ever tired of advantages. Now to act in conformity to the laws of nature is certainly an advantage. Do not you therefore grow weary of doing good offices, whereby you receive the advantages. To tie these threads together, here's a video introduction to Stoicism, though not Marcus's version of it in particular, that helps provide a broader perspective. Of all people only those are at leisure who make time for philosophy, only they truly live. Not satisfied to merely keep good watch over their own days, they annex every age to their own. All the harvest of the past is added to their store, the private diaries of one of Rome's greatest emperors, the personal letters of one of Rome's best playwrights and wisest power brokers, the lectures of a former slave in exile, turned influential teacher. Against all odds, some two millennia later, these incredible documents survive. They contain some of the greatest wisdom in the history of the world, and together, they constitute the bedrock of what is known as Stoicism, an ancient philosophy that was once one of the most popular civic disciplines in the West, practiced by the rich and the impoverished, the powerful and the struggling. Agasicles, king of the Spartans, once quipped that he wanted to be the student of men whose son I should like to be as well. It is a critical consideration we need to make in our search for role models. Stoicism is no exception. Before we begin our studies, we need to ask ourselves, who are the people that followed these precepts? Who can I point out as an example? Am I proud to look up to this person? Do I want to be more like them? The Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, the playwright and political advisor Seneca, and the slave turned prominent teacher Epictetus. These are the three Stoics you need to get to know first. Once you do, we're confident you will want to follow in their footsteps. Who is Marcus Aurelius? Alone of the emperors, the historian Herodian would write of the man who became known to us as Marcus Aurelius. He gave proof of his learning not by mere words or knowledge of philosophical doctrines, but by his blameless character and temperate way of life. Cassius Dio In addition to possessing all the other virtues, he ruled better than any others who had ever been in any position of power. Born April 26, 1 and 21, Nobody would have predicted that Marcus Catilius Severus Annius Verus would one day be emperor of the Roman Empire. The emperor Hadrian, who would have known young Marcus through his early academic accomplishments, sensing his potential, kept an eye on the boy. His nickname for Marcus, whom he liked to go hunting with, was Verissimus, a play on his name, Verus, the truest one. What exactly Hadrian saw in Marcus is unclear, but by Marcus's 17th birthday, Hadrian had begun planning something extraordinary. He was going to make Marcus Aurelius the Emperor of Rome. On February 25, 138, Hadrian adopted a 51-year-old man named Antoninus Pius on the condition that he in turn adopted Marcus Aurelius. Given life expectancy statistics of the time, Hadrian figured this regent and mentor might be at the helm in five years. All was well except Antoninus lived and ruled for 23 years. In 161, as Antoninus died and ended one of the longest reigns, Marcus finally became the emperor of the Roman Empire and ruled for nearly two decades until his death in 180. His reign wasn't easy. Wars with the Parthian Empire, the barbarian tribes menacing the empire on the northern border, the rise of Christianity, as well as the plague that left millions dead. The famous historian Edward Gibbon wrote that under Marcus, the last of the five good emperors, the Roman Empire was governed by absolute power, under the guidance of wisdom and virtue. The guidance of wisdom and virtue. That's what separates Marcus from the majority of past and present world leaders. Just look at the journal that he left behind, which is now known as his meditations, the private thoughts of the most powerful man in the world, admonishing himself on how to be more virtuous, more just, more immune to temptation, wiser. And for Marcus, Stoicism provided a framework for dealing with the stresses of daily life as a leader of one of the most powerful empires in human history. Who was born around 4 BC in Cordoba, Spain? 
the son of a wealthy and learned writer known to history as Seneca the Elder, Seneca the Younger was destined for great things from birth. Seneca's father selected Attalus the Stoic to tutor his boy, primarily for his reputation as a man of great eloquence. His son took to education with gusto. By Seneca's own telling, he cheerfully laid siege to the classroom and was the first to arrive and last to leave it. The most powerful lesson that Seneca learned from Attalus was on the desire to improve practically in the real world. The purpose of studying philosophy, Seneca learned from his beloved instructor, was to take away with him some one good thing every day. He should return home a sounder man or on the way to becoming sounder. While his commitment to self-improvement was beloved by his teachers, they also knew that his father, no fan of philosophy, was paying them to train his son for an active and ambitious political career. In Rome, a promising young lawyer could appear in court as early as age 17, and there is little doubt that Seneca was one. But only in his early 20s, Seneca's health nearly cut it all short. A lung condition forced him to take an extended trip to Egypt to recover where he would spend nearly a decade writing, reading, and building up his strength. He returned to Rome at 35 and 31 AD, a time of paranoia and violence and corruption and political turmoil. Seneca kept his head down for the most part throughout the equally terrifying reigns of Tiberius and Caligula. His life took a sharp turn in 41 AD when Claudius became the emperor and exiled Seneca to the island of Corsica. It would be another eight years away from Rome, and although he started productively, writing consolation to Polybius, consolation to Helvia, and on anger in a short span, the many writing consolations soon needed some consoling himself. So began his practice of letter writing, which would continue all his life. His given name is not known. Epictetus is Greek meaning acquired. Epictetus was born into slavery. Epictetus's mention of his owner, Epaphroditus, is surprisingly neutral because we know Epaphroditus was cruel even by Roman standards. Later Christian writers tell us that Epictetus's master was violent and depraved, at one point twisting Epictetus's leg with all his might. As a punishment, as a sick pleasure, in a wrestling match, trying to get a disobedient young kid to follow instructions, we don't know. All we hear is that Epictetus calmly warned him about taking it too far. When the leg snapped, Epictetus made no sound. He uttered no tears. He smiled and looked at his master and said, Didn't I warn you? For the rest of his life, Epictetus would walk with a limp, but Epictetus remained unbroken by the incident. Lameness is an impediment to the leg, he would later say, but not to the will. Epictetus would choose to see his disability as only a physical impairment. And in fact, it was that idea of choice that defined the core of his philosophical beliefs. Life was like a play, he liked to say. And if it was the playwright's pleasure, you should act a poor man, a cripple, a governor, or a private person. See that you act it naturally. For this is your business, to act well the character assigned you. To choose it is another's. And so he did. Law established by Augustus in 4 AD determined that slaves could not be freed before their 30th birthday. Epictetus didn't obtain his freedom until shortly after Emperor Nero's death. He chose to dedicate himself fully to philosophy and taught in Rome for nearly 25 years. Until the Emperor Domitian famously banished all philosophers in Rome. Epictetus fled to Nicopolis in Greece where he founded a philosophy school and taught until his death. They are the most essential values in Stoic philosophy. If, at some point in your life, Marcus Aurelius wrote, you should come across anything better than justice, truth, self-control, courage, it must be an extraordinary thing indeed. That was almost 20 centuries ago. We have discovered a lot of things since then. Automobiles, the internet, cures for diseases that were previously a death sentence, but have we found anything better than being brave, than moderation and sobriety, than doing what's right, than truth and understanding? No, we have not. It's unlikely we ever will. Everything we face in life is an opportunity to respond with these four traits. Of course, life is not so simple as to say that courage is all that counts. While everyone would admit that courage is essential, 
We are also all well aware of people whose bravery turns to recklessness and becomes a fault when they begin to endanger themselves and others. This is where Aristotle comes in. Aristotle actually used courage as the main example in his famous metaphor of a golden mean. On one end of the spectrum, he said, there was cowardice. That's a deficiency of courage. On the other, there was recklessness, too much courage. What was called for, what we required then, was a golden mean, the right amount. That's what temperance or moderation is about, doing nothing in excess, doing the right thing in the right amount in the right way. Because we are what we repeatedly do, Aristotle also said, therefore excellence is not an act, but a habit. In other words, virtue and excellence is a way of living. It's foundational, it's like an operating system, and the code this system operates on is habit. As Epictetus would later say, capability is confirmed and grows in its corresponding actions, walking by walking and running by running. Therefore, if you want to do something, make a habit of it. So if we want to be happy, if we want to be successful, if we want to be great, we have to develop the capability, we have to develop the day-to-day -day habits that allow this to ensue. This is great news because it means that impressive results or enormous changes are possible without Herculean effort or magic formulas. Small adjustments, good systems, the right processes, that's what it takes, being brave, finding the right balance. These are core Stoic virtues, but in their seriousness, they pale in comparison to what the Stoics worshipped most highly, doing the right thing. There is no Stoic virtue more important than justice, because it influences all the others. Marcus Aurelius himself said that justice is the source of all the other virtues. Stoics throughout history have pushed and advocated for justice, oftentimes at great personal risk and with great courage, in order to do great things and defend the people and ideas that they loved. Cato gave his life trying to restore the Roman Republic, and Thracia and Agrippinus gave theirs resisting the tyranny of Nero. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson formed a new nation, one which would seek, however imperfectly, to fight for democracy and justice. Largely inspired by the philosophy of Cato and those other Stoics, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, a translator of Epictetus, led a black regiment of troops in the U.S. Civil War. Beatrice Webb, who helped to found the London School of Economics and who first conceptualized the idea of collective bargaining, regularly reread Marcus Aurelius. Countless other activists and politicians have turned to Stoicism to gird them against the difficulty of fighting for ideals that mattered, to guide them towards what was right in a world of so much wrong. A Stoic must deeply believe that an individual can make a difference. Successful activism and political maneuvering require understanding and strategy, as well as realism and hope. It requires wisdom, acceptance, and also a refusal to accept the statu quo. It was James Baldwin who most brilliantly captured this tension in Notes of a Native Son. It began to seem that one would have to hold in mind forever two ideas which seemed to be in opposition. The first idea was acceptance. The acceptance, totally without rancor, of life as it is and men as they are. In light of this idea, it goes without saying that injustice is commonplace. But this did not mean that one could be complacent, for the second idea was of equal power, that one must never, in one's own life, accept these injustices as commonplace, but one must fight them with all one's strength. A Stoic sees the world clearly, but also sees clearly what the world can be. And then they are brave and strategic enough to help bring it into reality. Courage, temperance, justice. These are the critical virtues of life. But what situations call for courage? What is the right amount? What is the right thing? This is where the final and essential virtue comes in. Wisdom, the knowing, the learning, the experience required to navigate the world. Wisdom has always been prized by the Stoics. Zeno said that we were given two ears and one mouth for a reason, to listen more than we talk. And since we have two eyes, we are obligated to read and observe more than we talk as well. It is key today, 
as it was in the ancient world, to be able to distinguish between the vast aggregations of information that lay out there at your disposal and the actual wisdom that you need to live a good life. It's key that we study that we keep our minds open always. You cannot learn that which you think you already know, Epictetus said. It's true, which is why we need to not only be humble students but also seek out great teachers. It's why we should always be reading. It's why we cannot stop training. It's why we have to be diligent in filtering out the signal from the noise. The goal is not just to acquire information, but the right kind of information. It's the lessons found in meditations, in everything from the actual Epictetus to James Stockdale entering the world of Epictetus. It's the key facts, standing out from the background noise, that you need to absorb. Thousands of years of blazing insight are available to the world. It is likely that you have the power to learn anything you want at your fingertips. So today, honor the stoic virtue of wisdom by slowing down, being deliberate, and finding the wisdom you need. Two eyes, two ears, one mouth. Remain a student, act accordingly, and wisely. P.S. If you're looking to be a better reader, to build a real reading practice, the Stoics can help. We built out some of their best insights into our daily Stoic Read to Lead Reading Challenge. It's going to walk you through more than a dozen actionable challenges that will help you elevate your game as a reader. Learn how to think more critically and discover important books that will change your life. We've got videos and worksheets and all sorts of recommendations and strategies for you. If you've liked any of our other courses, you'll love this one. It's awesome. It's actionable. And it will help you get a better ROI out of one of the most important ways we spend our time and enrich our minds. Give it a shot.